Welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mary Ashen. We appreciate your spending some time with us today. With me today is David Schoenbaum, author of the new book, The Lives of Isaac Stern, a centennial celebration of the career and the legacy of America's foremost violin virtuoso and one of the 20th century's greatest musicians. A renowned historian, David has written a range of books, essays, and articles about German society during the Nazi era, U.S.-Israel relationship, international security, the history of music, and more. His words have appeared in outlets such as the New York Times and the Washington Post. In our conversation, David and I will talk about Isaac Stern's remarkable 60-year career from his formative years in San Francisco to concurrent careers as an activist, public citizen, and cultural leader in the Jewish community. David, it's good to have you with us today. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me. Well, before we dive into the book, uh, I'd like to talk about your love of the violin. And, and also, um, I'd like you to talk about the connection of, of Jews and the violin. I mean, if we look at that long list, uh, which uh, we can begin with Isaac Stern, and there's uh, Itzhak Perlman and Yehudi Menuhin and Pinchas Zuckerman, Yasha Heifetz, David Oistrach, Nathan Milstein, it just goes on and on. And you wrote a very interesting uh, piece in violinist.com about the relationship between Jews and the violin. So let's talk about your connection, and then let's talk about the connection of Jews and this very important instrument. My own <coughs> experience is totally fortuitous. The uh, Milwaukee Public Schools were quite serious about music. Uh, the uh, head of the music department uh, canvassed uh, the local elementary schools looking for customers. Uh, he called for volunteers. I raised my hand. To this day, I can't tell you why and what impelled me. There was no family history, but it seemed an interesting thing to do. My parents had nothing against the idea. The school system provided lessons uh, and a cheap instrument and one thing. One thing led to another. And, and Jews and the violin? That's what's the, me. What's the connection. And I expect the connection as it was in millions of Jewish families and millions of middle class Jewish families that playing the violin was something one did. It was a skill, it was an art, it was a bit of middle class integration. You know, in, uh, in 1990, uh, I was in Budapest, and at that time, uh, there were many Jews coming out of the Soviet Union, and uh, we were taken down to the railroad station in Budapest to meet a train that was coming in from the Soviet Union, and the immigrants would, would get off, and then they would be taken to some kind of, of transit uh, center, and then even later that day, many of them would head on to Israel in a, mm -hmm. in a later flight, so we went out very early in the morning. Uh, to meet the immigrants who were getting off, and they were taking, you know, big uh, uh, packages and suitcases uh, for their new life uh, in Israel. And um, I saw a little boy. Um, he was clutching, he was five years old, and he was clutching a violin case. Of course. Um, and um, I, I know that uh, the, the great immigration from the Soviet Union to Israel brought many violinists. And Stern was asked to do what he could to find gainful employment to keep them off the street. The joke, of course, at the airport was, uh, with the arrival of the Russians was uh, if they're not carrying a violin, they must be engineers or doctors. Right. Exactly. Well, let's talk about the book itself. What drove you specifically uh, to do in the 100th year since Isaac Stern's birth this particular a biography? Well, there were two considerations. One is that this is an interesting life, and he had conveniently left his papers to the Library of Congress. Uh, I discovered it just at the moment I was uh, looking for a project to keep me uh, busy. Uh, the larger context is that I had invested something like 20 years off and on uh, in a very large book on the uh, social history of the violin that embraced everything over five continents and a couple of centuries uh, from making the instrument, selling the instrument, playing the instrument, teaching the instrument. 
uh, and uh, uh, and the big picture led to the smaller one. Were you a, a big fan of Stern? I mean, did that also contribute to the idea of doing the no, biography? No the, no, the only time I, I, I wasn't a big fan. I wasn't an anti-fan. I, I, I think he was wonderful in ways that can still be located in YouTube. Uh, these earlier uh, Columbia Masterworks pieces he did, uh, for example, with Ormandy, I think are still wonderful. Uh, the couple of times I heard him, he was disappointing uh, to, to a point where I went home with my fist clenched. Uh, it, 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 he, he wasn't engaged. Uh, that night, and so that's not a great memory. Uh, but I, I, I remember him as a significant figure, uh, and, and of course thought he was worth writing about as a significant figure, but an honest book had to acknowledge that he was better some nights than others. Well, as a historian, of course, research is the key to everything. Um, where did you find your primary information, secondary information, about Stern in your biographical research uh, process. And um, did you discover anything that surprised you about his life, something out of left field that, that you didn't think you were going to encounter? Well, I could say center field because he was a great admirer of Joe DiMaggio. But we, 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 he shared a podiatrist. A fellow. DiMaggio. You asked about his personal life. Right, who, That's who played in. Personal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, who played in, who played in uh, I think, for the San Francisco Seals, I think. It, it yes, that's right. No, no, as, as a kid in San Francisco, inevitably, uh, that was part of his landscape. Uh, <clears throat> were there any big surprises? No, there were no big surprises. It uh, seemed to me, a very, in its way, a generic American life of a certain kind. And, and, and he was interesting uh, because he was so representative of a generation and a place and a time in so many ways. So he was born actually in Poland, it became yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in those days, <clears throat> boundaries were shifting uh, constantly, but he was only, I think, 14 months when he was brought to the United States yeah, to yeah. San ten, Francisco. Ten, ten, 10 as I remember, but in any case, he was a baby. Uh, and uh, the luck began there because uh, they arrived before 1924 and that's uh, draconian and the immigrant one. And uh, the family settled in San Francisco in a, yeah, in a, were, Jewish, in a Jewish neighborhood? Uh, in a sort of Jewish neighborhood. Uh, it, it wasn't exactly clear to me how they got there, nor was it clear uh, to his uh, kids, uh, to his daughter, uh, whom I asked about it, why San Francisco. There seemed to be some family connection, and some previous member of the family had got there. And when I asked the next, the follow-up question, how did they get there to San Francisco when people generally arrived from the other direction in New York or Baltimore? Uh, they couldn't tell me where they had, had they, they, they'd crossed the Pacific, is my impression. But I, I don't know if this is the case. So he began playing the violin very early, like you did. Yes. Uh, when, when was it uh, discovered that, uh, that this fellow had uh, a terrific uh, talent. Well, he took it up uh, as he lost no opportunity to tell people because the kid across the street had got there first. Uh, and so he took it up because the other kid had taken it up. The, the other kid uh, dropped out and grew up to sell insurance. And Stern himself discovered that uh, he liked it so much that his mother didn't have to make him practice. Uh, another great virtuoso was also a San Franciscan, uh, Yehudi Menuhin. Well, there were three uh, of them. The third was uh, Lugero Ricci. Did they have any contact? Now, Menuhin was several years older, I think, than Stern. Uh, contact, have... contact, well, as, as grown-ups, of course, they did. No, as grown-ups, they did, but, 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 but as, as, children as young people. Know, as children know, uh, say that <clears throat> uh, Menuhin, uh, who was slightly older, was a kind of um, role model. Uh, for, for both Stern and Ricci. So take us back to uh, the 1930s, back to a teenage Stern's first concert appearance. Set the scene for us. Where did he perform? And, and what was the critical response? Well, he performed uh, locally to the point that it was even uh, newsworthy on the inside pages of the paper. He was, he was a local prodigy, acknowledged as a local prodigy, invited 
uh, to the kinds of places that wanted a kid to perform. Uh, he then uh, lucked into a network uh, which was associated with the local reform synagogue, which had a charismatic cantor uh, who was a genius at uh, recognizing talent and therefore discovered not only Menuhin but other local prodigies, like Leon Fleischer, the pianist who died recently on that circuit, uh, and connected them. Uh, with wealthy congregants uh, <clears throat> who could afford to and were motivated uh, to see that this talent was properly uh, appreciated and, uh, uh, and, and, and properly developed. And where did he get that first very positive critical response? I mean, I know in, in the newspapers in those days had music critics and they yeah, followed the these things quite, they, quite closely. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 no, and the, the local reviews, in fact, were quite favorable. But in those days, uh, there was no way around the uh, Carnegie Hall recital as the uh, as the definitive test, and that one was a challenge. And uh, he made it the second time. That's the the gold standard. Yes. Uh, briefly, uh, take us through the development of Stern's uh, musical abilities. Did the quality of his playing change over the years? And what about his technique? Well, he's, uh, like everybody, uh, even myself, uh, uh, we're, we're not what we were when we were younger. Uh, and it, it showed in his playing as well. And uh, uh, but, but his uh, technique was prodigious uh, in the early years. I mean, there was nothing he couldn't play if he wanted to play it. Uh, and what distinguished him from many of his peers is that he played contemporary music. He played how did his approach would never touch? How did his approach to uh, the music of past composers <clears throat> set him apart from the other violinists of his generation and of prior generations? I mean, you say he he would play things that others would not. Um, give us an example of that. Well, it's the easy one is Bartok. Uh, he played Bartok while well, Bartok was still alive, <coughs> and that was something that the that Milstein wouldn't have touched. It was something Heifetz wouldn't have touched, uh, and and he went out of his way. Szymanowski, the, the Polish composer, uh, he played Szymanowski, uh, and, and and this was acknowledged uh, a bit ambivalently, as a matter of fact, in the early reviews uh, in, in the Eastern papers. Now, as a, as a young man, um, as his talent becomes more and more apparent, um, he, they have to make a decision, or his parents have to make a decision, his mother has to make a decision about whether to homeschool him, because clearly he's got a career ahead of him. How do they deal with that? You no, know, I, I found that interesting, too, and uh, got a little help uh, from Leon Fleischer, uh, uh, whom I interviewed on the subject since he'd basically grown up in the same place at the same time. California law was very tolerant about prodigies. Prodigies were allowed to stay home and practice with the qualification that uh, the school system itself provided tutors. And so for a certain number of hours a week, in principle, uh, they were tutored at home uh, by a visiting teacher in order that they could maintain their practice schedules. I, I've never encountered anything quite like it, uh, but but I, I can't imagine it's unique. At, at what point does he go out on the road? It was very important, and we have it today, of yeah. course, still. Uh, you, you just traveled around the United States, and in reading your book, I mean, I saw some of the cities in which um, Stern played. Some of these were not um, the, the, the mega cities, the big... Uh, urban center, some of them were smaller cities around the country. Tell us a little about that, touring the country. Well, uh, he, he began on the West Coast where he was local in a sense and uh, played, I think it was, uh, made, made it at one point as far as Mexico, but all of that before he was an established concert performer. When he became an established con uh, concert performer, he went where there were series. Uh, and the series in those days were, uh, <clears throat> Uh, were, were booked through the New York agencies. Basically, there were two of them uh, affiliated, in fact, with the broadcast networks. Uh, and 
you went on the road uh, to play the violin in, in the same way you uh, went on the, the, the road as my father did uh, at age 16 to sell farm shows. Uh, and that would take you wherever you were invited for a civic concert series. <clears throat> and that in those days meant some pretty small things. And he was remarkably loyal about this and continued through his life uh, to, to commemorate, to, to remember the people who had invited, invited him and played with him. So local uh, he, teachers, teachers were very important uh, to, for prodigies. Um, tell us a little about the influence of his teachers on his work. Well, the one he uh, acknowledged, uh, venerated, in fact, uh, was uh, Blender, the concertmaster of the uh, San Francisco Symphony. And what he most admired about Blender was that uh, uh, Blender uh, <coughs> discussed things with him and basically let him make his own decisions. So <clears throat> the career grows, and we'll talk about his, his trajectory in a minute, but we've talked about the concert tours um, where does where does Saul Hurok? I mean, where does where does the, if you will, uh, the big leagues of classical music, um, in terms of management, venues, recording contracts, where does that all come in? Oh, the the, the, the Hurok story is wonderful. Uh, he he had first caught on a manager uh, <clears throat> in Chicago uh, who had uh, discovered him. Uh, who had uh, a roster, I think, of two. Stern, unknown, was one of it. Uh, the other was uh, uh, the Don Cossack Chorus. Uh, Hurak lusted for the Don, uh, <coughs> for the Don, uh, <coughs> for, for, for that chorus. Uh, and therefore, there was a kind of trade like the baseball owners in February. Uh, and uh, in order to get the Don Cossacks, he agreed, did Hurak, to take Stern. Uh, a total unknown. Uh, in fact, on both sides, blind. Like the, uh, the player to be named later. Yes, that's right. I, 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 that may even have been on the contract. Uh, and so uh, it, it turned into a significant relationship in his life. I mean, he almost father and son. Uh, uh, and and, and Hurak himself became a celebrated figure. Uh, yeah, that association with Hurak as an impresario, we don't have that really today. No, but but that was that for for an artist. Um, th that was the the creme de la creme. You had to have that connection to Hurak, correct? Well, you certainly needed a major manager, uh, and, and and Hurak was more interesting than many. Uh, uh, in, in part because he was, had strong views about the music, uh, and in part because he was, he was an individual uh, whose competitors were all corporations. Well, tell us about the trajectory of Stern's career, not only as a performer, uh, but as an individual who was committed to important causes, uh, a trait that really set him apart from many musicians of his time. For example, he not only helped to save Carnegie Hall from demolition, but he breathed new life into the venue as well. He had that connection um, uh, after the, uh, the renovation, uh, saving this important uh, venue and this important building. Uh, tell us about that. Well, he uh, first uh, pulled off a couple of political prodigies. This is to say he got the legislature in Albany to do things. He got the uh, city government in New York to do things, uh, in effect, call Carnegie Hall uh, something more than a piece of real estate. It became a uh, kind of protected uh, historical monument. Uh, it was uh, then off the market, and uh, uh, and, and he himself uh, showed a lot of managerial talent. Uh, as uh, I was regularly told by his proteges. Uh, if he hadn't made it in music, he'd have made it in politics, he'd have made it in business, he'd have made it in diplomacy. I mean, he was a many-sided guy, and, uh, and he was very good at coalition building. Uh, and uh, he was very good at uh, managerial priorities. 
uh, and he pulled this off consecutively, pulled it off in New York, he pulled it off in Jerusalem. Uh, in his way, he established a beachhead of all places in Shanghai. Uh, and, and, and I can't think of anyone to match him. Uh, the only approximation would be uh, Joachim, the, uh, uh, the great 19th century player and uh, buddy of uh, Brahms and uh, the Mendelssohn family and uh, so on. Uh, I mean, who was very well connected uh, and uh, was a public figure, created the Berlin uh, Hochschule, uh, and uh, was well aware of his public stature and his public image. Uh, and there's nothing like that before or after until Stern. Well, the, the Carnegie Hall story is um, it's interesting because it's uh, much akin <clears throat> to Jackie Kennedy's uh, saving of Grand Central Station. Well, say uh, that she became the president of the company. And she did exactly, not hang exactly. around to, at the station. Exactly. But the, the, the interesting thing to me is, is that this was, this was a time of uh, what was called then urban renewal. Um, people were interested in, in making way for new office towers. Um, and there wasn't this uh, appreciation for these, these great uh, venues, these great sites, um, which were still, with some renovation, um, not only very useful, but of course were, were very much in demand as, as prestigious venues uh, for playing. So um, that story itself, uh, in that time, I mean, today there's much more uh, appreciation for historical preservation, but uh, not, uh, not really at, at that time. Um, yeah, but there, 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 there is, uh, the story subsumes another story, which is to say <coughs> the salvation of Carnegie Hall coincides with the creation of Lincoln Center. And Carnegie Hall was in competition with Lincoln Center. Uh, the New York Philharmonic left Carnegie Hall to play at Lincoln Center. And so the building had to be rehabilitated and uh, so, so, so did the mystique. And that's part of the achievement. Well, fortunately, he, he succeeded, but that's not the only monument he, he, he left, uh, as you've said. Mm -hmm. um, he had passions outside the music world too. And during his life, uh, he became a, a real fervent supporter, advocate for Israel. Tell us more, you, you've alluded to it. Tell us more about what he did to advance Israel's cultural life. And uh, at a very early stage of uh, the new state's um, uh, existence and development, and uh, how did his support impact classical music's popularity there? Well, I think popularity was no problem. He was just entranced by a place where people um, <clears throat> arrived uh, for the concert uh, in shorts uh, and open shirts and carried scores. Uh, and he hadn't encountered that uh, in New York, uh, let alone in Sioux City. Uh, and he thought this was a wonderful place. So, so selling the product was no problem. The problem, as he saw it, uh, was developing the talent of which uh, in a heavily East European Jewish diaspora. Uh, there was an awful lot of talent, and therefore he was on the lookout for it, found it, and uh, realized that there had to be a way to uh, institutionalize teaching to connect it uh, with the wider world. And his great achievement in a sense is uh, the creation of uh, a legacy that includes uh, names like Kalman uh, and uh, we well, visited Israel many times Hundreds over the years, years. and, and, and there, are some, there are some terrific stories of his playing for soldiers uh, during the Yom Kippur War, mm -hmm. uh, his being, I think he was actually even performing at the, in 1990 uh, during uh, the attacks, the Scud attacks uh, that were coming from, from mm -hmm. Iraq. So mm -hmm. he, it, it appears that uh, certainly at least every year and maybe more than once a year, he was, uh, he was in Israel. No, he was, he, he was often there and heavily engaged and uh, knew everybody of the founding generation. Uh, the 1990 performance uh, with the audience in gas masks, uh, that's an unforgettable image. Uh, but he had been there when needed and wanted all the way back at least uh, to 67. Now, he, <clears throat> he toured the world. Um, he was um, <clears throat> a performer. 
who um, <clears throat> was sent out on State Department. Um, well, he was a exchanges. I mean, there's yeah. a famous, there's a fa he, he toured the, the, I think the Soviet Union um, as early as 1951. Um, and, he, and he said at a certain point, uh, this, this famous line, um, they send us their Jews from Odessa and we send them our Jews from Odessa. Talk about that touring. He toured, he played in China, they played in, in other countries. This must have been very important to him. Well, he uh, early on uh, was appreciated as a bit of what the professionals call soft power. He was soft power. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, ambassadors begged him, in fact, uh, for him at uh, local festivals. Uh, he discovered Japan before it was a fashionable thing to do. He visited India at a time when nobody uh, much visited India. He made his way to Australia when that took some doing and maintained the relationship. Uh, he played, I, I, I think it is safe to say, played at one time or another on every continent but Antarctica. Uh, and uh, in the case of the Japanese relationship, that was very durable. Uh, and in fact, his, uh, by a nice coincidence, uh, his, his Columbia, his recording company, uh, ended up as a property of Sony. So even his uh, Japanese connection even extended to his record company. Now, Stern developed uh, innumerable uh, collegial partnerships with conductors and performers, particularly Leonard Bernstein, but not only. Mm -hmm. um, what, what impact did their relationship have on, on each of their lives? And tell us also a little about Stern's revival, his con contribution mm -hmm. to the revival of chamber music uh, and his relationship to men and women with whom he concertized. Well, he made a very good thing of his trio uh, with uh, Rose and the Stoneman, uh, which they lucked into and discovered uh, that they were onto something and liked it and continued recording and played until uh, the Stoneman died. In fact. Uh, and uh, so the chamber music continued uh, long after his active concertizing career was passed. Uh, he played with his protégés quite regularly uh, and uh, was, in fact, his chamber playing protégés. Uh, Emerson Quartet, Ordinary Quartet, uh, tell me that he still played very well uh, all the way deep into his 70s. Now, as, as his career progressed, he became also more of a crossover artist, if you will, who expanded his repertory and his music uh, was introduced to new audiences. Uh, the same can be said for his uh, on-screen performances in a number of popular documentaries like From Mao to Mozart. Yes, no, that's, uh, that's, How do you feel this affects his legacy? Well, it only makes him visible. Uh, that uh, I would imagine if you check out your uh, YouTube, uh, that you'll find more stern in more places than any other concert performer of his time. Uh, that, that for one or a reason or another, uh, he continually shows up in seminars and festivals and occasions and interviews. He was a very good interview subject. Well, he was, he was such a commanding presence. Uh, let me just say parenthetically, um, uh, in reading your book, uh, clearly he kept much of his correspondence. Um, because there are there are a lot of letters there. He just was 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 such a a commanding presence. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, from the Jewish pers perspective, um, as as someone who was very <clears throat> proud of of who he was and saw his place in the community. But of course, then he was also a world figure. What do you think? Um, in a hundred years after his birth, <clears throat> what do you think the the pillars of his legacy are? Well, he left a legacy of uh, recorded performances, uh, so they're available uh, for those who want to find them. Uh, he left uh, a cadre of protégés uh, who are now the elder statesmen of the profession. And these are not only Jews, like Kermann and Sukhumar, but in, uh, include Yo-Yo Ma and include Nijori. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and these people are now the senior citizens uh, of the music world. Uh, 
uh, and looked at uh, a and appear on appropriate occasions like presidential inaugurations, in a sense, legitimizing the art uh, as a public presence. Uh, and and, and uh, that, that will probably extend to the end of their careers. Uh, but, but, but the world has changed in such a way, just look at the Democratic Convention, uh, that uh, the art that meant so much to his generation, his parents, his family, his tribe, uh, that this art uh, is no longer a big item. Uh, I would think in Generation X and after, uh, in ways that affect his heritage. I, I, I was impressed recently, uh, the centennial occasion, uh, that there, there, there were commemorations, but not in the obvious places, such obvious places as the New York Times uh, or Washington Post, that, 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 that it was a known event. Well, he certainly <clears throat> was a giant in his field and a giant in our community. And, it, and he was a giant in his time. And in his time, and in his time. Well, uh, David, David, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the book is The Lives of Isaac Stern by David Schoenbaum oh. and is available online wherever you purchase books. It's, it's wonderful to be able to explore Isaac Stern's many lives uh, and the story of a man who truly lived the American dream uh, in every way. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today, David. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me, Dan. So thanks to David Schoenbaum for joining me and thank you for tuning in to this conversation with B'nai B'rith. If you like what you've heard, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn more about our work. For my guest, David Schoenbaum, I'm Dan Mariasha. See you again soon. Take care, everyone.